Good morning, Griffin First. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Whitney, and I am Pastor Ron's youngest daughter. I uh, lived here about five years ago and uh, lived here and went to this church called at home for about four years. But now uh, I live with my family in Stockholm, Sweden, and I am in the ministry full time. I'm a Bible school director and I work uh, as the church administrator too. So I followed in his footsteps, a couple, <laughs> a couple of the footsteps at least. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I'm just so honored to be able to be here today and to honor my dad and get to share with all of you. Um, and the past couple of weeks, you all have been in a series called Worship Plus. So today we thought that we would call this sermon Leadership Plus. And we want to share with you a couple of the biblical premium leadership tips that we have picked up from dad along the way that we would like to call crumbs. <laughs> um, dad likes to say, if you know one person, you're a leader. And so that means that every person in this room, you are a leader. You don't need a title to be a leader. All you need is yourself and one other person and say, let's go and follow God, right? <laughs> you are leaders in your home, in your community, in your workplace. As Christians, we should be leading and modeling the way. Our lives should be a reflection to other people. They should be so, um, what, they should be attractive to the world, right? So we're all leaders in this place, and I really believe that these tips that we're going to share are not just for the one who has a title of leadership, but it's for everyone. Um, I got the sweetest puppy whenever I was about eight years old named Joey, and dad's already laughing because he knows what I'm going to tell now. <laughs> And Joey was the cutest dog. He was just a white, curly-haired, little tiny dog. But he really bonded with my dad and not with me, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, and so every time dad would leave to go and minister wherever he was going in the world, Joey would get sick, like really sick, because he was so bonded to my dad. And they just didn't know how to break it to me that we could not keep Joey. I mean, it was because of his health. It was an issue that we, we couldn't keep Joey. And so my dad, he, he's very clever. He's very clever. And he, and he knows that I love missionaries. I love the missionaries. Uh, whenever I was a little girl, you know, we had BGMCs, Bo Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. We had Buddy Barrels. I was saving money. I would keep the little missionary cards, and I would keep them on top of my dresser at home and look at those cards and pray for uh, Quentin and, and uh, Elizabeth and their daughters because I, I had their picture <laughs> on my dresser. But Dad gets the idea, you know what? Whitney loves missionaries. So he tells me, Whitney, Joey is a missionary dog. <laughs> and he needs to go and spread love to other families. And my sweet little eight-year-old heart just, yes, he is. He is being sent out on the mission field. Let's pray and bless him and send him out to the other families. I totally bought it. I mean, I was like, yes, he is a missionary dog. And guess what? We visited that missionary dog at the three other families that he went to. <laughs> Dad would get me in the car. Let's go see Joey. He's, he's doing the Lord's work. <laughs> And you know what the funniest thing is that I didn't even realize that dad had told me that just to help me handle the loss of that pet until I was in like high school. And then one day I was sitting there like dawned on me like, wait a second, you told me he's a missionary dog? <laughs> like if that is not the most pastor's daughter thing that has ever happened. <laughs> um, but yeah. Joey did. He went on to live with an old man who needed a companion, and he lived a happy life. So we're very ex 
just I'm happy for Josie, for Joey. And then <laughs> later on, I got another dog, and I named it Josie. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, now, don't be hard on Dad because he lied to me. But <laughs> he was he was helping me out. But something my dad has repeatedly said to me, and it's a leadership tip for you today, a crumb, if you will, is what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. And this is not just a saying, it's a biblical principle of reaping and sowing. What you put in the ground is what's going to come out. So whatever you put in the ground, whatever you are sowing into the ground, whatever you're sowing into people, because that's what we do, right? That's who, uh, as a person, you have relationships in your life. What you sow into other people, you're going to see in your own life. Um. So I want to take us to the book of Acts to see the power of this principle. In Acts 10, we meet an influential man, a leader in his community, Cornelius. He's described as a devout and God-fearing man. He's not just a Jewish, he's not a Jewish man at all. He's actually part of the Italian regiment. He's a Gentile. And this is what it says in Acts 10, verses 3 through 8. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Cornelius is remembered by God because of what? His prayers and gifts to the poor. He's a generous man, and his generosity is recognized by God. And that fear of God that he has as a Gentile, his his fear of God as a Gentile is going to open the door for his whole family and so many others to come to faith. So after Cornelius receives this vision, Peter at the same time has a vision himself. And he sees a big sheet being let down from heaven with all of these animals that the Jewish people are not able to consume. And, And God tells him, Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. And he has to tell Peter twice that you could actually eat that stuff. (laughs) He says, don't call it uh, impure. It's clean. It's been made clean. So Peter is thinking about this vision. The men from Cornelius' home come to him, and they say, you got to come with us. (laughs) So Peter's like, kind of confused because he has this vision of all of these things that are impure. The the way of life that he's had, he's he's like, I've not been able to eat those things. Lord, what are you trying to tell me in this? What are you trying to tell me? But he arrives at Cornelius' house, and Cornelius, the leader that he is, he's gathered his whole family and all of his close friends together. And and he's like, you're supposed to tell us something, Peter. (laughs) And, and um, Peter's like, I'm not even supposed to be here. Jews and Gentiles, we're not even supposed to uh, eat together. Do you guys know this? But nobody seems to care. He obeys the vision from God and, start to, and starts to share the gospel with them. And it says in Acts 10, verses 44 through 48, While Peter was still speaking these words, while he was still sharing the gospel, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So the Gentiles, who up until this point have not been included in the salvation message, are then let in. They're grafted in, like it says. They're let into the kingdom of God. And who is it through? It's through Cornelius. 
and what he's done for other people. What you make happen for others, God is going to make happen for you. Do you see his, his generosity? God could have chosen any Gentile family. But he used Cornelius because he saw a heart that was after him, fear of God and gifts to the poor, generosity coming out of his life. And God says, I'm going to use this man to show that the Gentiles belong in my family. So we have to think, God, what do you want to help me make happen for other people? You know, and it's not a transactional thing that we, that we have. No, we don't say, God, I'm going to do this, so you better do this for me. No, it's out of a, re a relationship with God. It's out of the grace that you've received in your life that you say, you know what? I'm going to take my influence here, and I'm going to make something happen for someone because God has already paid the ultimate price for me. And he has given my life so much grace that I'm going to pour out into someone else. I, I'm speaking on this specifically because I have had such huge blessing, like miraculous blessing in my life. Not because of what I've done, but because of the way my parents have been faithfully serving God and, and serving and ministering for 45 years. And I don't say that lightly. My parents are very generous and they love to give people gifts. They love to give extravagant gifts. I don't remember how many times my dad has given a car away or just, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, just giving like a very, my mom is the best gift giver that anybody, any of my friends know even. They're like, what would your mom give this person, <laughs> right? Um, on Christmases growing up, dad would buy a bike and give it away on Christmas Day to a kid who was in need just because. Not because anybody told him to, just because he wanted to. Um, and they've done all of that, all of that generosity. It's, it's, what does it come from? A love of God and, and thankfulness for the grace that he's given us. Um, whenever I moved to Stockholm, I had saved as much money as I could um, but I knew that it would only get me through that first part of my Bible school year. And I was just believing that either I was going to come home or God was going to provide the rest. And one day I got a call from my dad and he tells me, Whitney, there's people that want to fund the rest of your year. And guess what? That was, that money is what made it possible for me to finish Bible school and Bible school, sorry, and to be able to share the gospel with so many people. But it's important what you make happen for others, God is going to make happen for you. How are you supposed to follow up his daughter? Yeah. Well, I'm so thankful to be here this morning with you, Griffin First. This is a house that means a lot to me. This church does. And this man does. Dr. Ron means so much to me. I grew up, I spent most of my life under the leadership of Dr. Ron Crum. I'm from West Virginia originally. I was fortunate enough to grow up. I went through kids' church. I went through middle school. I went through high school. Around that time, Dr. Ron made a transition down here to Griffin, Georgia. And when I graduated, he knew I had a call of God on my life. Encouraged me to come check out a place called Valor School of Leadership where I would come and be a part of the congregation here at Griffin First Assembly and graduated from there and have been launched into full-time ministry. So I've spent a lot of time with this family. And don't worry, I'm going to get into the word. But Dr. Ron, I just want to address you, Phyllis, your girls, your grandbabies, your sons-in-law. Your family is my family. Your family is my family's family. My mom was on the video. If every one of them could be here today, I know they wanted to. I know they're watching right now because they love you. Your whole family has been family to us, and I'm thankful for it. Even just this week as I was preparing this message, you know how Facebook pops up with your memories? Well, I, I had a memory pop up from 14 years ago. I was 13 years old at the time, and I posted what 13-year-old me would post on Facebook. I said, school is dumb with about seven Bs on the end. <laughs> That's what I posted. And under that post, I saw a comment from Dr. Ron, 
And he commented on a 13-year-old status and encouraged me and said, love you, Pastor Ron, on the end. And I thought, how incredible that I get this opportunity today to speak here after all that we've been through. A long time you've been in my corner, Dr. Ron. So after graduating from here five years ago, I've been in full-time ministry, and I hear these crumbs in my head all the time. I hear them constantly. And we had this conversation when they asked me to come speak We were talking about the different things that you say, and there's one that I hear in my head more than any other thing that you've said, and it is this, do what you say you will do. I hear it on a weekly basis in my head, in your voice, all the time, do what you say you will do. And I know that Dr. Ron knows something that I hope all of us in this house know today, and that is that there's no greater leadership example than Jesus. There's a lot of great leadership books out there. There's a lot of people who know a lot about leadership. But if your leadership principle doesn't come back to Jesus, I'll probably pass on it. And I know that every crumb that this man gives out, you can find it in the word of God. And in scripture, Jesus made a whole lot of bold claims. If you've read the scriptures, it's kind of his thing. People took issue with it a lot. Jesus made bold claims. Here's the thing about Jesus, though. He always backs it up. You'll never find an empty promise from Jesus. Everything that he says will come to pass. He's the master of doing what he says he's going to do. There's no one better. And now this simple idea of doing what you say you will do, it comes in two parts, right? It comes in, say what you plan to do. That part's easy. Then there's the second part, figure out a way to make it happen. Figure out a way to make it happen. And for us living now, In a time after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, there are a lot of scriptures that I love, but maybe none more than this one found in John 14. This is verses 12 through 17. Jesus makes a promise to his disciples that he also makes to us today. It says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name and I will do it. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. There's two things here That really stick out to me that Jesus said. The first is that he said, all these things that I've done, you will be able to do the same things and greater, right? And then he says, the Holy Spirit that has been with you will soon be in you. Say what you want to do and then figure out a way to make it happen. In my life, my greatest leadership wins and losses have come from, can I back up what I said? Can I back up what I said? How do we expect anybody to follow us if all we do is throw out empty promises? It doesn't take a leader to say things you wish would happen. It takes a leader to make things happen and to see things happen. I put myself in an interesting position more than once where I had a microphone in my hand like I did today. And I've said some things. You know, you're in the moment. The Lord's moving. The Holy Spirit's moving. And you just get excited. And you get up there on that microphone and you say, we're going to do this. And then you realize later, oh, no, what did I say? I can't take that back. I have, I'm a youth pastor. We have our services on Wednesday nights. I've had many blank stares on a Thursday morning thinking, what did I say last night? How am I going to make that happen? And just to be honest with you, there have been moments where I thought, okay, can I get away with not doing that? Is there any way that I can do some damage control here? And figure out a way to maybe not do what I said I was going to do. But then there's that voice. Then there's Ron Crumb's voice in my head (laughs) that says, do what you say you will do. I found my greatest wins when I said something bold, but I was able to back it up too. People trust you. Whenever the Lord leads you, you say something bold, but you have the ability to make it happen. Jesus said a long list of things that I would consider bold, a long list of things. But put yourself in the shoes of the disciples here. These are the people that saw him heal people, that saw him take just a little bit of 
bread and fish and feed thousands of people. They saw him walk on water. They saw him literally raise people from the dead. What is more bold than hearing you will do all these things too and greater? That is bold. I'm sure their ears perked up. If they weren't listening before, they were then. But leader of all leaders that Jesus is, he didn't give an empty promise there. He put his own investment in it to see that it would happen. When those words leave your mouth, your word is on the line, and you have to see that it happens. So Jesus, it says in the scripture that he calls upon the Father, that the Father would send the Holy Spirit to not just be with these people, but to be in these people. I'm thankful, I know I'm in a church today that believes in the power for us to be able to do today the things that Jesus did and greater, that Jesus still heals and sets free and saves and he delivers people, all of that. But how many of you know you're gonna have a tough time doing that if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you? That's what the difference was. When the Holy Spirit filled people, is when they were able to do the things that Jesus did and even greater. And then he does it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit, began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Then after that, some more specific than others, but 29 accounts of miracles in the book of Acts alone that these mere people, just like you and I, now filled with the Holy Spirit, were able to go and do. Jesus made sure what he said was going to happen, happened. Amen? Just like Jesus said it would happen, it happened. This occurrence amongst countless others when you read through the scriptures, the gospels especially, are why Jesus is our greatest leadership model. There is no one better than him. But truthfully, for me in my life, before I could understand that Jesus was doing it, there was a man in front of me doing it, Dr. Ron Crum, who I know has lived his life modeled after Jesus. And I was just a kid in kids' church. Dr. Ron, I remember every Christmas, I'd sit on those steps and you'd read a Christmas story to us. And not only did I do it when I was a kid in kids' church, I did it in college. We sat on the steps that were right here, and you read that Christmas story. I've had a lot of cool full circle moments with you. Before I really understood the word of God and got to see that Jesus was doing it in the scriptures, I got to watch you do it. I watched a man who, when he said something, you could count on it. When he casted vision, you could know that he meant every word that he said. Not only did he pray for me, and prophesy things over me from when I was a child, here, many moments in this room and in that room just behind the sanctuary. Not only was it that, there was a personal investment in my life. That it wasn't just, you'll go and do great things. It was, let me help you do great things. And I'm thankful, so thankful for it. Now, in the position that I'm in, I have to prioritize doing what I say I'm going to do. Because I know Jesus did it, and I've watched you do it. And Dr. Ron, because of your life, this new book that I'm so excited about, I cannot wait to read, the model that you've lived and the lives like mine and so many others that you have poured into, the thumbprint of your leadership goes way beyond this moment. It's bigger than this book. It's bigger than any of us. It's going to go on forever. Thank you so much, Dr. Ron. I love you. Good morning, everyone. Let me get myself set up here. My name is Lindsay. If you don't know me, you probably see me around. I live right here with you all in Griffin, Georgia. Thank you, God. Oh, okay. I'm his oldest daughter. That's right. All right. I want to get right into the scripture. I see that clock that you see. I know what time it is, and I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Right before Jesus ascended to heaven, the last thing he told the disciples was found in Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we see that the disciples got busy doing just that. We find still in Acts down to chapter 2, verse 42. They, meaning the disciples, devoted themselves 
to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I would say, knowing the disciples, they prayed first. <laughs> this Holy Spirit is the same man who in Acts chapter 2 causes Peter, who denied Jesus, is now proclaiming the gospel. He denied Jesus three times, and then every time he spoke, a thousand people came to the Lord. Thank you, God. All right, down in Colossians 3.23, we read, Whatever you do, do with all your heart. Oh, I can't even look over there. Jesus, help me. On January 26 of 2014, my dad announced to our church in West Virginia that him and my mom would be coming down to chase the devil down in Georgia or whatever the song says. And it was exciting. And then, oh God, I don't even think we had lunch. We went right to the hospital and his mom, my grandmother, passed away. And that sent me into a tailspin of a year. I can give you detail. I'm very detailed, so it's very hard for me to not tell you even what I was wearing on that day. Because I can see it so plainly. But um, that day, I don't know if any of y'all live in this, but like the before and the after. I don't know if you have anything in your life that's marked time for you that way. But in my mind, it's like before January 26, 2014 and after. So that year was... It was wonderful because y'all moved down here. Whitney went to grad school. But when I tell you I was alone after losing my grandmother, oh, I can hardly speak of it. On January 26 of 2015, literally one year to the day, the Lord gave me my job. I'm a flight attendant, for those of you that don't know. And I love my job. When I tell you I love my job, I love my job. But somewhere in there... In the last nine and a half years, I got married. I have two young kids. And some of y'all come on that airplane. And when I tell you, you know, you wear the backpacks and you turn around and you whack everybody. I know not y'all, but people, other people do this. <laughs> Or you poke me when I'm walking down the aisle. Or you ask me for your drink without ice and then a, a, a black coffee, but where's my cream and sugar? And I'm like, okay, you just, you just had black coffee. Okay, it's okay. If I'm not careful, I can let my head respond to people without responding to them and how I have in my heart. Jesus, help me. Paul in Romans says, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. And I don't know, don't leave me hanging out here, but help me, Lord, to do the good that's, that I feel in my heart, but sometimes it don't come out of me that way. Jesus, help me. One day, I was driving home from work, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, who in your path is aware of me because of how you've shown my heart today. And I know people are real curious about how flight attendants work. There's like, in my company, there's like 28,000 flight attendants and our trips are like one to three days. So I've worked with the same person like maybe a handful of times. Like I meet new people every time I go to work. So I asked the Lord, show me, show me You've changed my heart. You've put something inside of me, and why am I not projecting that? And I, it came to my remembrance. There was a lady at our church in West Virginia when we were little, and she would give out bags of candy to the kids as they were leaving, and they had these little cards on them. And they're very simple. It literally just, they're all different, by the way, popopencards.com. And they all say a different verse, and they all have a little one-liner. Like this one says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears, Psalm 34, 4. And then it says, when I pray, God takes away all my fears. Literally, a child could understand these, okay? They're all different. <clears throat> and so I started carrying them around in this bag. I got this out of my work bag this morning. I started carrying them around with me. And at the end of a trip, I just give them out to the people that I work with. And 
I can tell you, even though it's so simple, but I have those in my pocket, so I know, like, make sure you act in a way that's showing the love of Christ. So whenever I give out this Bible verse, they don't say, well, who cares? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I know down here in Griffin, Georgia, like, people know the Lord, but out there, all kinds of crazy stuff is going on, okay? Um, and can I tell you, people of, you know, they open it, and I'm like walking down the jet bridge because when the trip is over, mama don't play, I'm going home, okay? And they are like chasing me down saying, hey, you don't know, you don't know what's going on in my life, but God does. I needed to hear this today. And um, me and dad were in the car, and one of my friends texted me and said, hey, I'm working with a guy, and he knows who you are because he's still carrying this card around in his pocket. I mean, this is so simple, you guys, so simple. But people are out there that do not hear that Jesus loves them, that God has a plan for their life, anything. So God, help me. Oh, God, help me that when I walk into Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, I don't say that this is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to show the love that you have put in my heart, oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Lord, help me. And I don't mean just at my job. I mean whenever I'm at home leading these kids and feeding them cereal. And I don't mean for breakfast. I mean for dinner whenever it's one of those days. Okay? Because how else? How else are we going to break generational curses off our children? I've been through some things that I don't want my kids to go through. And I know you may look at me and think, oh, what could you have possibly gone through? If you want to know, I will sit down here and tell you. But trust me, I don't want my kids to pay the price that I have. Oh, Jesus, help me to say this how I have it in my heart. Oh, while I'm in there putting my heart into it, I'm going to put my back into it as well. Because like it or not, putting your heart into it looks a lot like work. Oh, Jesus. If you are going through a difficult circumstance today and you're wondering, how can I even lead myself? It's all I can do to make it through this day. Please know that everyone in this room has had a broken heart sometime or another. When we started preparing for this day, I was just reflecting over the past 10 years. I don't mean a whole lifetime. I mean the past 10 years that we've been here. And I thank God that there's more to our story. But in that time, in our family alone, our family unit, we've lost my grandmother, my mom's mom, my other, mom, my other grandmother, my mom's brother-in-law, Bill, my dad's brother-in-law, Joe Harless, his niece, Michelle, his brother-in-law, Gary, his nephew, Adam, his nephew, Jerry, and my dad's brother, Benny. And that, gosh, sometimes when I, I can barely even say their names out loud. But I know in Colossians 1:17, Timothy wrote, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I just want to. Can I also tell you, in the 10 years that we have been here, we have celebrated my Uncle Joe receiving the Lord in his life, my dad's brother John, and along with his wife Debbie, his sister Frances, his nephew Scott, Craig, Grant, Blake, Natalie, Isabella, they have all been baptized. We've added two son-in-laws and five grandchildren. And I thank God that he doesn't mind proving himself time and time again. He's the only one that can top the last thing he did. He's the God of multiplication. The assignment I have found that wherever we are, oh God, whenever I get to heaven, I want to be able to say, I did it all with the heart that you gave me. And sometimes it didn't come out quite right. And sometimes I had to go back and apologize. But it was always at your service. It was always with the next generation in mind. Oh, God. 
He is as close as the whisper of his name. He will send all of heaven to surround you. And can I just tell you, there have been times that all I can do is just say the name of Jesus. And I don't mean Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I mean Jesus, Jesus, glory, glory, glory. How am I going to get through but glory by saying his name? How am I ever going to become a praying grandmother with if I don't go through some things and come out on the other side? Friends, I'm here to tell you today, whether you're in West Virginia or Georgia or Stockholm or I'm on the airplane or I'm fighting for my life in that new uh, line at Walmart, the assignment is still the same. It is still be fruitful and multiply. It is still be fishers of men. We are still called to be the light of the world. Still honor the Lord. Still put others before ourselves. I still have notes from the last message you preached in West Virginia. And the verse you shared is this, Proverbs 16, 9. A man plans his ways, but the Lord orders his steps. Thank you, God, that you did. Thank God I didn't plan it because it would have turned out horrible. And he's still writing our story. So we, we always remember that he's writing our story. He's writing the story of everybody in our path. It may take some twists and turns, but in God, the best is always yet to come. Okay, okay, Lindsay, hold on just a second. You got to come back for a second because you, you can't just, the whole room is standing, okay? So the whole room is standing. How many of you know your credibility is a byproduct of your authenticity? And the things that Lindsay and, and the others, Chase and Whitney, have got up here and said today have been right smack dab in the middle of their heart. And... Uh, Lindsay, we, we could feel the emotion in that and know that you believe everything you just said. And, and I'll, I'll transition and close this here in just a second. But, girl, you got to pray for the people. They're, they're standing, and you just, look, they didn't sit down. Okay. Come on, pray for us. Oh, God. Oh, God, I thank you, God, that you are a man of your word. I thank you that it doesn't return void, oh, God. I ask you, God, that you would fill this room with your presence, God, that each and every one, if they need their hearts healed, God, that you would heal their hearts, God, that you would empower each and every person, oh God, to live out your word, oh God. How else are they going to know you, God? Empower us, oh God. Show, help us to show your spirit, oh God. I thank you, God, that you can back up, that we don't have to make up things about you, that you will do what you said you will do in your word, oh God. I I thank you, God, that you are a God of multiplication, that you don't add and subtract, that you take our little bit and you multiply it to be more than what we could ever think or ask, oh God. I ask you, God, that you would touch every single person in this room, oh God. Let us fill your presence, oh God. Let us, let us behave in ways that you say that we are, not how we feel like we are. Oh God, give us your strength, oh God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lindsay. And listen, we're, we're going to close out here. And so just go ahead and stay standing. But I, um, ah, man. I heard uh, somebody say recently, success in life in ministry is not measured by what you do, but by what you set in motion. Because if it were by what you do, you're going to strive every single day to get something done. Sometimes you don't get to always see the effects of your reach and your touch. But as long as you're putting something in motion. And what I have loved about Pastor Ron, I've known him for a long time, is that he is a dreamer. But not just a dreamer, he's the dreamer's dreamer. And uh, if you've known me for more than five minutes, you, you know my favorite Disney movie is The Lion King. And I talk about this sometimes. And uh, I just love the Rafiki character 
uh, while Simba's off running around all crazy with the warthog and the meerkat in the jungle eating bugs, right? Like, what in the world? This wise baboon is like, I got to go show this. We got to get him back to his destiny. And so, the, the, right, the baboon goes out, finds him, and they're doing, singing the songs, Kuna Matata, nope, nothing matters, whatever. And the baboon's like, hey, I, 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 Simba goes, you knew, you knew my father? And the, and the monkey goes, correction, I know your father. <laughs> it's my favorite part. And so they have this moment where Simba realizes, I, I, I've, it's, I, I got some, something to do. I, I've got a life to live, a destiny, you know? And so, like, what, whatever it is, man, the monkey, Rafiki, he's just like, Psh. He, he just, like, launches him, and Simba takes off and, like, goes back to the pride land. You guys remember The Lion King. Don't look like, don't act like you had never seen that movie. So what I love about that movie is I, I often aspire to be like Rafiki. Like, I'm trying to hold up the lions, you know. Like, I want to be able to lift people up and encourage and stuff. But then sometimes I get to think, like, am I, am I, the baboon or am I the little lion you know just like which came first the chicken or the egg you know before you become the wise baboon that helps the lion you are a lion you are a small a small cub lion that gets uh hit over the head with a big stick by the baboon and pastor I'm grateful for, for all the times that you hit me over the head with a big stick when I was running around in the jungle hanging out with a warthog and a meerkat singing Hakuna Matata like nothing else mattered. And I'm thankful today. A year and a half ago, we, this is wild, we were sitting up here in my office just between the service and I, I didn't even realize it. A year and a half ago, I went to the Wright Brothers uh, Museum uh, in uh, North Carolina and I had no idea uh, that this would happen to me, but I'm walking through and like everything I read and see about them, it's the wild thing is like, I'm thinking about you and it's the craziest thing. And so I buy these things, I bought three things and I thought one of these days I'm going to give those to, to Dr. Ron. I had no idea until we were sitting up there and I saw the bag sitting in my office and Derek, I think you have that bag there, hand that to me and it just clicked with me. This is, this is the moment it's for. I mean, it, it makes sense, but it's like, who knew? You know, I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about this. But I bought this book that says, it's a kid's book, but it says, what do you do with an idea? What do you do with an idea? By the way, he's releasing a book today. But this book says, what do you do with an idea? And I'm not going to read the whole book, uh, as you would do with us at Christmas time. Uh, <laughs> But what I am going to do is fast forward, and I'm going to spoil it for you. But I just love what the very end says. So the idea, you know, it's personified as like an egg, like the kids walking around with an egg, right? So it's a kid's book. But at the very end, um, I love this part. <laughs> it says, I couldn't imagine my life without it. It's talking about the ideas in an egg, right? And then it goes, then one day, something amazing happened. My idea changed right before my very eyes. It spread its wings took flight and burst into the sky <laughs> and there's the illustrations really cool uh, but uh, you have to look it up later uh, it says I don't know how to describe it but it went from being here to being everywhere it wasn't just part of me anymore it was a now part of everything this is so sweet and then I realized what you do with an idea you change the world and I grabbed the book. I remember standing there grabbing this book. And I'm reading it. You know, I'm a grown man reading this kid's book. And I'm thinking about the people who've believed in me and the things that I've, you know, wanted to accomplish. And, and, and that's you. And I don't know what this means to you. But I want to give you this book because of your book. And, and just a couple other things here. I think these are, these are fun. I know you like puzzles. So here's a Wright Brothers Museum puzzle. 
and also this cool little uh, like vintage newspaper thing, you know. Here's the thing, guys. I'm going through this museum. Oh, and here's a bag to put it all in. I don't, could have just handed you that, right? Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm in this museum, like, reading about the Wright brothers who, like, they tried so many times and they failed. They tried so many times and they failed. And I'm like, that's me, man. You know, but then there are people around you who are cheering you on, rooting you on. Like, when you fall, man, get back up again. And for me, that's been Pastor Ron. And so this day is just about celebrating, celebrating him and thanking God for men of God like Pastor Ron who are humble, who lead well. They love God and love people. And uh, I'm so thankful for that today. And so I'm going to pray. And then, and then I've got one of the, the crumbs uh, too that I'm going to share before we leave that you always say, but I get to say it this time. And, uh, you know, it took Truett Cathy 10 years to get the, into the culture for the, the team to say, it's my pleasure, right? This man has lived a whole life of these things. And I'm just so thankful. So we all ought to be saying, we all, we, we do. I mean, Chase, you find yourself saying these things all the time. It's just, it's, it's amazing. But I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you. We celebrate today. We do. We're grateful for your goodness, your grace. In every season of our lives, God, we thank you for Pastor Ron and Miss Phyllis and their family. Uh, what a beautiful gift they are to our church and uh, in all of the, all the seasons that we've walked through the last 10 years here. And, and of course, the, for those that have been uh, with him beyond and, and those. But uh, I just thank you for that, Lord. And we celebrate this day. It's a day of celebration. Thank you for what you have done through him, through his leadership, God. We love you this morning, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, and so, Pastor, here's what I want to invite you to actually go out to the foyer, because you're going to have some books to sign uh, for anybody that may want to pick up one of those day census leadership books. And so if you'll do that. And then for the rest of you, I just want to say, go out and be great and do great things for Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. Amen.